Okay, so um, uh, as Annalise points out, uh, the first half of uh, the presentation, I will deal with common sports medicine injuries. And in the second half, well, I'll discuss uh, common conditions that we run into. Um, I just want to start briefly by saying that um, I have no commercial conflicts of interest and I don't invest or advise any companies that I might mention um, in this talk. Um, and this really is just designed to provide a high level overview of the, the common things that we see, but also some of the frontline primary care management. So we, we will cover a fair bit of ground. And at the end, um, as I said, we will uh, hopefully have time to reflect on some cases and involve participants in discussion. So this is um, just a link, uh, a picture of my website. And it has been a really excellent opportunity to create educational content for patients, um, particularly in the years after I obtained my fellowship. Um, this really is an extension of some of the latest updates in sports medicine. Uh, there's plenty of videos for patients and it's a great resource for them if you're pressed for time um, in explaining some of these conditions and injuries. Certainly if it helps give patients a bit of insight and perspective on their condition, then these videos have served their purpose. And the first thing I want to address is that sport and exercise medicine is really not just about elite sports. We, we treat any and all patients with conditions that affect their capacity for exercise. And as we are seeing increasingly, lack of exercise is harmful and any small level of exercise um, to combat inactivity has a multitude of health benefits for all of our patients from mental health to metabolic and diabetic health um, and so on. So sport and exercise physicians total about 300 across Australia and New Zealand, and there's about 50 trainees. Um, we have a very broad and deep curriculum, and, and this is because it needs to cover essentially any injury or condition that affects exercise capacity. So to start off with, I want to address the influx of COVID related injuries or, or injuries around the time of COVID. And I think we all intuitively know that injury risk is certainly increased with fluctuating exercise and activity. And there probably is a sweet spot. And um, one of, the, um, one of the, the most contemporary studies to demonstrate and at least quantify quantify this relationship between activity consistency and injury risk it was published very recently by a physio and exercise physiologist from Adelaide, Tim Gabbard. And what he found was there really is, it's a non-linear risk. We see that um, there is most likely a, a degree of regular chronic load or exercise that results in reduced injury risk but at, the, um, at either end, at either tail, um, we see you know, uh, an increased risk. So that, that, needs, that would be consistent with what we're, we've seen during and post COVID lockdowns with lack of access to, to gyms and um, a loss of consistency with people suddenly increasing outdoor exercise. Um, and while we've certainly seen less acute trauma and less concussion this year, um, underlying issues like osteoarthritis or tendon problems, Achilles tendon ruptures, they've all definitely gone up. And I guess my theory for that is, uh, is, is simply a matter of decompensation. People compensate very well for, for a variety of issues. And a lot of us, I mean, we're very aware the x-rays don't corroborate as well as we would like with the patients. And we see um, osteoarthritis that is completely asymptomatic um, uh, commonly. So uh, I think it's important that if we do see patients with decompensation of existing conditions that uh, we feel uh, and help them in, um, stay positive, that they can live well without perfect joints and without perfect tendons. And getting back to consistent regular exercise loads is possible. So general principles, I think in terms of rehabilitation, we can divide injury rehabilitation into three phases. And this is generally how I explain it to my patients as well. So the first step is to reduce the irritation of the injured tissues, give them some time to rest. And this is usually for the first couple of weeks in most cases, the goal being to protect the injured region 
whether we use bracing, strapping, plaster, depending on the severity of the injury. And certainly um, a medical certificate if they're manual or on their feet. And you know, sometimes we'll provide anti-inflammatory treatments if there is a real excess of inflammation and swelling related to that injury. But in most cases, um, the goal is just to protect and allow some early loading as is tolerated um, unless there's a fracture. And so while milestones for this vary from injury to injury, generally once a patient can perform their activities of daily living with reasonable range of motion, we can progress on to phase two. And in phase two, the goal here is deliberate overload, just as you would do um, trying to, to strengthen uh, an uninjured patient to achieve specific adaptation of the injured tissues. So this diagram here is a, um, a picture of a process termed mechanotransduction. And essentially the same process happens in tendons, bones, muscles. If we deliberately overload them, they respond to the direction and the magnitude of that load. And so when you think about it, all rehabilitation is, is prescribed exercises that maximize these signals, these biological signals for healing and remodeling, at the same time as simultaneously avoiding movements or positions that trigger pain and might make the injury worse. So a good example is with a calf strain injury, we wouldn't stretch the calf because that would pull the, the muscle tendon fibers further apart, but we might be able to begin some light strengthening in this stage. And, and this really is a skill. And um, having been a physiotherapist myself, I think this is really what separates um, uh, good from great physios. And I think it, it helps to have physios that you know can really help patients avoid irritating the problem whilst getting them stronger over about a, a six to 12 week period. Now, if they're meeting functional milestones, they then progress to the final phase which is the coaching and return to sport phase. And this is really important if people are very active and, and want to get back to, to sports that put a lot of load on their joints. And that's where the rehabilitator or the coach will watch them perform their activity and make it uh, as efficient and safe as possible to minimize injury recurrence. So this is something we can't do in the clinic and it's, it's often underestimated. So now into the injury. So patellofemoral pain syndrome um, it's got a lot of other names, a runner's knee, chondromalacia, but basically um, pain coming from the anterior knee region, uh, in, usually in younger patients, it can be really debilitating. It's important to help patients understand this condition. So the patellofemoral joint is the joint between the patella, obviously, and the groove in the, in the femur called the trochlea. And... Um, while this joint enjoys the thickest cartilage in the body, it really needs this cartilage because it takes a whopping amount of both compressive and shear forces. So every time you bend your knee, the cartilage surfaces on the back of the patella engage at about the 30 degree angle there. And so when you lunge or you go up or downstairs, the joint has to take on as much as 10 to 12 times your body weight in force. And as you might recall from histology, hyaline cartilage has this very unique architecture. So the top layers have collagen fibers that are oriented horizontally to take on those shear forces. And then the deeper layers down in the, in the bottom have vertically oriented uh, collagen fibers to take on the compressive forces. So when the kneecap doesn't track smoothly in its groove, that then leads to increased shear forces on the cartilage. And that can abrade and irritate the cartilage. And even though there may be no macroscopic damage, um, patients can develop pain and stiffness that can persist for months. So we think that this is more of an inflammatory response to microscopic chondral fragments rather than any um, macroscopic damage. And so uh, certainly that, that would fit with the pattern of pain um, because we know that cartilage is a neural. So the, the, the chondral surface wouldn't be contributing to the pain. Now in these patients, um, one of the interesting findings is that sitting for any length of time um, leads to stiffness and pain when they get up. And so the condition was also called moviegoer's knee in the past, but runner's knee has interchangeably been used. And ultimately the correct terminology is patellofemoral pain syndrome. And so 
there may be completely normal imaging findings, but most of the features are functional because it's more of a dynamic process occurring here. And uh, classically, we have this history of anterior knee pain with a few known risk factors, such as um, uh, the, the age of the patient or their activities. There's also very often pain with squatting and lunging and tenderness and grinding sensations around the kneecap. So the major diagnoses to exclude in this case are instability of the kneecap, so that dislocations and, and another condition called excessive lateral pressure syndrome. And uh, that's certainly rare, but that does lead to abrasion of the cartilage on the outer side of the kneecap. So who's at risk of patellofemoral pain syndrome? Well, it's commonly associated with a small or high seated kneecap, a, a flat groove for the kneecap or, or trochlear dysplasia. Females are certainly at high risk, people with short hamstrings and weak quadriceps. And importantly, there may be patients who have none of these anatomical uh, or, or demographic features, but they just have weak hip abductors. And so a really common pattern of pathomechanics here is poor stabilizer muscle up and around the hip and, um, and also sometimes associated with overpronation, excessive hind foot pronation. And so overall, this leads the knee to fall in into this adducted position. And over that, that resulting alignment then leads to excessive contact forces in this outer part of the kneecap. So it needs to be made clear to patients who have this condition that surgery is virtually never appropriate unless there's a really large malalignment, dislocations, um, and even large cartilage lesions. Um, certainly, um, you know, that while they would warrant a surgical opinion, um, they, it is a controversial area of care. So even if there's degenerative changes, as you saw in this video, we tend to avoid surgery because non-surgical treatments are often very effective. Now, the best consensus guidelines tell us that patellofemoral pain syndrome has to be, management has to be individualized and based on each patient's specific um, contributors to their pain. So, uh, when we look at treatment programs that contribute to this consensus guideline, programs that last at least six weeks and that are multimodal in their, in their approach. So they, they educate patients, they use tools such as patella taping, uh, sometimes changes in footwear and orthotics and potentially some non-steroidal anti-inflammatories um, are far and away very effective to manage the condition. But in recalcitrant cases, especially when the fat pads around the knee are sensitive or inflamed and they're contributing to muscle inhibition around the stabilizers of the knee, a single periarticular cortisone injection can provide a window of opportunity to get that patient into the neuromuscular stability exercises they need to recover. So now on to meniscal tears. These are really a very common cause of morbidity in our society. I'm sure everyone here sees patients with uh, meniscal tears and um, it is uh, also a quite a controversial area of, of medicine, uh, particularly the, ro the role of arthroscopy. And um, we see here, we've got the medial and lateral meniscus and uh, um, the ring shaped um, cartilages that help spread the load through the joint. And, like most tissues, the menisci, you know, soft tissues, the menisci are made up of type one collagen fibers that form fibrocartilage. And it's smooth and glossy on the surface, a bit like articular cartilage, but also it, it can resist stretching and tensile forces. And um, that's really important to its function. This unique architecture means that the vertical forces are resisted a lot like a rubbery hoop and um, the way that it creates stability and protects the underlying cartilage is really highlighted by the fact that patients who have a partial meniscectomy are five times more likely to develop osteoarthritis. And the blood supply is really important to understand because it comes from the outside in. And this means that tears that occur on the inner margin of the meniscus are very unlikely to heal, uh, whilst tears that occur peripherally are much more likely to heal. And then that has importance as to whether it's a, a tear is appropriate for surgical repair. 
or whether um, debridement is more appropriate if patients have ongoing symptoms. Now, acute meniscal tears can occur in younger patients with excessive compression and rotation, but they're really unusual in isolation and they tend to occur with other ligament or instability episodes. And um, we much more commonly see chronic meniscal tears, which I think are much more commonly termed wear than tear, and they occur with aging as part of the spectrum of OA. So surgery for these has been shown to be unhelpful in most cases. And patients with meniscal tears, they generally have pain that localizes to the side of their meniscal tear, as well as swelling of the joint, and in particular pain with loaded flexion um, and rotation. So uh, ultimately with meniscal tears, if a patient is having mechanical symptoms, that is locking, um, painful, very painful clicking or giving way of the knee, then an MRI and referral for a surgical opinion is warranted. But in the vast majority of cases, there are indeed no mechanical or strong mechanical symptoms other than maybe a bit of painless clicking. And there's quite a variety of different patterns of meniscal tears we'll go through now. So this is a peripheral tear on the outside of the meniscus. And um, when they're painful or unstable, certainly a surgical opinion can be obtained. Um, unfortunately, if they progress, they can turn into these bucket handle tears that flip into the inside of the joint and can lock the joint. Now this is a radial tear that we're seeing now. That's on the inside, that inner margin. And when they open up, we call them a parrot beak tear. And generally uh, they can also, uh, we can have combinations of different tear types on, uh, uh, if they're co combinations, we call those complex tears. And generally, again, they affect this inner avascular margin. So horizontal degenerative tears are the most common form and they occur as a part of the spectrum of tissue wear and osteoarthritis. Uh, they can lead to pain, they don't always, um, but they are not repairable. And we generally have to manage these with load modification and just as we would with osteoarthritis management um, being sensible with um, activities. And sometimes fluid from the inside of the joint can actually leak through a horizontal meniscal tear and form a, a perimeniscal cyst that can cause some discomfort, but generally these cysts don't cause much pain at all. So the first line treatment for stable meniscal tears that are not displaced and causing any locking of the knee is a non-surgical approach. And this includes relative rest, optimal loading, so you don't have to, the patient doesn't have to do nothing, but, but usually downgrading to some cycling or walking for someone who was doing higher level activity is helpful. And sometimes some anti-inflammatories also help. And if pain and swelling are really impeding their ability to perform even basic strength exercises, that's when NSAIDs and sometimes injection adjuncts can be helpful to get them into the rehab. Now, um, if cortisone is used, we really try to minimize that because multiple cortisone injections in quick succession has uh, in the past been shown to accelerate chondral loss. Um, it's really important to look at each individual patient's biomechanics uh, because uh, often there's pathomechanics aggravating a, a meniscal tear that can be corrected quite simply. And uh, after a minimum of eight weeks of this approach, then a surgical opinion is certainly warranted. And this is ultimately because there's been multiple consistent studies published in the modern era that show there's no overall difference uh, between partial meniscectomy and sham surgery, or indeed no surgery for these patients with stable meniscal tears. One of the most common issues that we see around the shoulder that causes pain is bursitis and impingement. And this is otherwise termed the rotator cuff syndrome. Now, any patient who's got a painful and weak as opposed to a painful stiff shoulder can be suspected to have the rotator cuff syndrome. We see in this anatomical section, the subacromial space is this area underneath the bony arch of the shoulder. And just like many areas of tissue movement, it's got a bursa, you can see the stending here. And so we've got the ball and socket, the rotator cuff and the bursa now that we're seeing in a more isolated view. And this helps it slide under the acromial arch when the shoulder elevates. 
And just like most forms of deep bursitis, it coexists very often with irritation of um, the, the adjacent tendon, which is the rotator cuff group of tendons underneath the bursa. And as we've all seen, if this bursa swells and becomes inflamed, it can cause pain. Now, most of the time, uh, it's this bursa being compressed against the arch of the shoulder due to an imbalance of forces as we elevate the arm. And you can see here the rolling and gliding of the arm during lift. This is just a, a, a basically demonstration of the, the net forces when we elevate the arm. We see the deltoid muscle, the vector is straight vertically upwards, while the rotator cuff has this downward inward vector that helps center the ball in the socket. And if the deltoid is winning the, and there's an imbalance of the forces there, the, the humeral head will bounce into the acromion and then you'll end up with bursitis. So really this is a pathomechanical issue that's uh, important to understand. It's not just the bursitis um, or the rotator cuff. It does require a holistic view of all of the spectrum from tendonitis, tendinopathy to tears of the rotator cuff. We have to try to restore the normal uh, mechanics of the shoulder and that takes time. So here we've got a view of the rotator cuff as a broad flat group of tendons wrapping around the head of humerus and pulling the ball into the socket. And when there's a lot of abrasion over years, we, we can develop little bits of wear of the rotator cuff. And they're usually not as dramatic and acute as this. Um, usually they're partial tears that can be managed with avoidance of aggravating overhead activities and, and lifting activities and some targeted shoulder stability exercises. And a full thickness tear, as we showed you there, that, that can occur if that process occurs for a really long time or with acute trauma. And as you can see from this video, the suture repair invests the tendon back into the bony footprint um, and tends to be done arthroscopically now. So with a patient with a painful, weak shoulder, particularly if they've had acute trauma, uh, an MRI in combination with clinical examination findings looking for weakness picks up about 85% of cases and acute full thickness tears usually need to be repaired so that people can function well, but not all chronic full thickness tears need to be repaired. And we have to consider the, the age and the activity demands of each specific patient. It's really important to understand the terminology with respect to rotator cuff tears. Um, because I, th I think it really helps us um, interpret uh, the radiology reports that we get and understand um, what to do with the patient's disposition. So it's a really nice diagram that shows at the top the different locations of tears. So uh, there's this infraspinatus, supraspinatus and subscapularis. The most common being the middle one here, supraspinatus tears. These are the, uh, the locations of the tears. So with partial tears, you can have them on the top surface, the articular surface of the rotator cuff, on the bursal surface here um, on top, sorry, underneath. And then you can have interstitial tears that go into the substance of the tendon. And full thickness tears just go all the way from the top to the bottom. The important thing about full thickness tears is while they sound terrible, because there's a gap somewhere along the cuff, they, they sometimes cause very minimal pain and weakness when they're small. Um, but we see down here, this is a tiny one, but when they retract, um, you know, it's a bit like a hole in jeans. Once, once they're really retracted, they lead to a lot more dysfunction and weakness. And the big concern there is the development of OA of the shoulder if they're left untreated. But the first line treatment for bursitis and the rotator cuff syndrome up to and including a partial thickness tear of the rotator cuff should be initially avoidance of activities that aggravate the shoulder, so overhead and lifting. X-rays should be done just to exclude structural causes for impingement. So we can see a bony spur on the tip of the acromion there. Um, and that's unusual. Uh, and NSAIDs can be very helpful for a course of about 10 to 14 days if the patient tolerates that to settle their bursitis. And then rehab exercises to restore the, the centering and balance of the shoulder. And an escalation to a cortisone injection can be considered if the patient can't make progress. And of course, this needs to be combined with rehab exercises 
soon after the, well, within a week of the injection so that um, the patient can really get the benefit um, and apply that to their rehab. Now for bursitis alone, the results of surgical decompression are very controversial and studies have consistently shown no long-term benefit of either open or arthroscopic debridement when compared to an exercise-based approach, approach at two years. But overall, if there's weakness, so when you're examining a patient, they've got weakness to external rotation or they can't lift their arm against your resistant, they can't elevate that arm. And that weakness you feel goes beyond pain or inhibition from pain, then we should be suspecting a rotator cuff tear. And in those patients, especially if they have high activity demands or it's their occupation, then a surgical review is appropriate. Now, labral tears are another uh, controversial area. The labrum of the shoulder is this thick rubbery tissue that lines the socket like a white washer, and it deepens the socket to improve stability. And the shoulder really is uh, unique in how mobile it is. This is a dislocation being shown here. And, um, and that would cause an acute tear of the labrum. And but patients can also develop chronic tears that are caused by gradual overload, especially in people who have hypermobile shoulders and are very, uh, very stretchy through their tissues. So you might see this in swimmers and throwers. And you can see in detail in this video here, the biceps tendon is a really important stabilizer. It, it straps the ball down into the socket. It attaches to the superior part of the labrum. And, um, and look, it can peel back away from the socket and be really painful every time the biceps tendon is loaded. So chronic labral tears can be really difficult to manage, especially because a lot of uh, overhead athletes will have these with no pain. So um, if the joint is unstable, uh, that's when we might escalate management for these. Now, common signs of labral tears uh, oh, and symptoms, the patient will tend to report deep seated shoulder pain. It will generally be long lasting and associated with some clicking and clunking. They may have features of impingement as well because there's a loss of some of the stability of the shoulder and that superior migration again will, will occur. And these clinical tests, you can see this is called the slap rehension test. It's pushing against a, a loaded um, uh, arm in that position and they're not very reliable. So the most reliable test is an MR arthrogram other than uh, arthroscopy, of course. And that can be combined with a steroid injection at the time of the in injection of contrast, which will not only pick up over 90% of cases of labral tears, but it also then helps that patient try to manage conservatively without surgery by reducing their pain and, and then getting them into some rehab for, a, for at least a several week program prior to thinking of surgery, if, particularly if they're small labral tears. But once the labrum is torn, the shoulder certainly loses a degree of stability and patients can go on to the, the same impingement and rotator cuff syndrome uh, we've mentioned. And so in these patients, particularly with hypermobility of the shoulder, a, a period of rehab of even up to upwards of four to six months is, um, is warranted before surgical options because they can often stretch out their surgical repair. And uh, as I've said, this is a bit of a difficult and, and controversial and individualized area. Now, ankle sprains are really common. Generally, they recover very well and they can occur at any age. You see here, the ankle tends to roll inwards with this inversion type sprain. And that's an injury there to the anterior part of the capsule called the ATFL. Generally, patients recover very well with these. They can usually still walk. And even if the ligament never repairs, they can um, get back to everything they were doing. A grade two injury then involves uh, partial or full thickness tear to the next ligament along called the CFL, the calcaneofibular ligament. And uh, generally these take longer to recover from. And then grade three, obviously there's more inversion there. Um, the CFL is fully torn and then it tends to affect the ligaments around the back of the ankle, the PTFL as well. And as with any acute injury, the same principles apply in terms of relative rest and optimal loading, uh, ice compression, elevation. My recommendation for these patients with the ankle sprain is to follow them up at two weeks. We know that 90% of patients with ankle sprains are close to a full recovery by two weeks. So if your patient still has pain, then 
we should be considering one of the five infamous occult fractures that can occur around the ankle. Now, these can be tricky because it's exactly the same mechanism that occurs and they can be missed on x-ray and certainly patients can wait there with these early on. They include the avulsion injury of the fibula down the bottom, anterior process of the talus, the lateral process of the talus, and the base of the fifth metatarsal, as well as the, the talar dome. You can have a small chondral injury, osteochondral injury of the talar dome. And so that's why it's good to follow patients up at two weeks. We can't go around doing an MRI and CT of every ankle sprain, but if they're not improving at two weeks, it's useful to investigate further. Now, high grade injuries might do better with a short period of immobilization, such as with avulsion fractures or, 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 um, uh, or very high grade three sprains, but less than 10 days is recommended in, in a boot because um, generally patients can get a lot of stiffness and be slower to recover because of this. Now, the most common cause of chronic ankle instability is inadequate ankle rehabilitation. And so most clinicians won't refer to a surgeon until that patient's trialed good quality rehab for at least six weeks, sometimes in combination with bracing and taping to assist. And the evidence shows us that the bracing and taping actually reduces the risk of recurrence from the moment they are put on to the, the level that would be expected by about three months post-injury. Now, if the patient has a lot of difficulty getting their range back after four weeks, they could have an impinging meniscoid lesion. That's basically scar tissue in the anterolateral or anteromedial gutter of the ankle that blocks their motion. And these often respond very well to intralesional cortisone injections. And overall, if they're just not getting better despite rehab or they've had more than three big ankle sprains in a year, they probably have chronic ankle instability and warrant a surgical opinion. Now, patients can also have a different type of ankle sprain called a syndesmosis ankle sprain. In the interest of time, I'll show you the mechanism of injury here, but we won't go into too much detail. This is uh, the mechanism here. The, when the foot turns out to the side, these strong ligaments down at the base of the ankle can tear apart. And the recovery time is much longer for these. They're called high ankle sprains. Now, Generally, the swelling looks very different. It's higher up on the ankle. And in fact, there's often less bruising. We can pick them up with point of care ultrasound. Often an MRI helps us make sure there's nothing else involved like cartilage injuries. And as, uh, we now have new technology with weight bearing CT that can tell us whether it's stable or unstable. But with uh, the same treatment applies as to any acute injury. And these ankle stirrups are often really helpful to push the bones back together and help the ligament heal in, in the right position. But um, I did do some research uh, four or five years ago and we found uh, that among rugby players, a single PRP injection given in the first week improved return to play by as much as three weeks on average in rugby players. So that was a very positive finding there. It was quite a small case series that we ran. Achilles tendon ruptures are the last injury that we'll go through. These are uh, thankfully uncommon, but they're really important because delay in treatment can lead to really disastrous and poor outcomes. And uh, I certainly have missed a few of these in my early days working in emergency. Now, um, what happens is the tendons separate further if it's not picked up and they scar down in a, in a shorter position and people never get their strength back if the tendon doesn't restore its length tension relationship. We know that people with diabetes are at higher risk, anabolic steroids increase risk and fluoroquinolone antibiotics like ciprofloxacin can certainly increase the risk of rupture. And therefore my advice for patients who are on those antibiotics is to avoid plyometric or jumping exercise for at least six weeks when they're on these antibiotics. Now, most patients will have no pain prior to the rupture. In fact, Achilles tendon pain is, um, is very uncommonly associated with rupture. And generally, they'll describe a pushing off event where it feels like someone hit them in the back of the heel. And then it becomes difficult for them to weight bear. 
but they can still wait there because the other tendons, the perineal tendons and tibialis posterior are still um, intact and uh, can move the ankle. So the diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis. And we see this as the Simmons-Thompson test. If you see the foot hanging vertically like this with no tension in, in the Achilles, that's the Simmons sign. And then if you squeeze the calf and the heel doesn't reflexively point, it doesn't pull down like this, that's the second sign. And both of those signs are present. The patient functionally has an Achilles rupture. And in fact, imaging with, particularly with ultrasound can, can confuse the, the, the picture so that treatment's delayed. This is an example of a patient who had an ultrasound that showed a partial thickness tear. And of course, at surgery, it was found to be completely ruptured. And the explanation given by the authors of this study was that the hematoma fills the gap and can basically look like normal tendon tissue. So we should trust, this is one case where we have to trust our clinical judgment. Now, while Achilles tendon ruptures can be managed really effectively without surgery, patients have to be very compliant. And the key here is early recognition because we wanna get these tendon ends together as quickly as possible. And delay in that can lead to scar tissue that blocks the tendon healing in a normal position. Patients should be given crutches for the first couple of weeks and only ever be put into a boot or plaster with their toe pointing down like this. It's really important that the toe is pointing to bring those tendon ends together. Now, um, the problem is that a lot of people will put a patient into a boot and this immobilizer seems like a good idea, but in fact, it pulls the tendon ends apart and leads to that lengthened healing. So it is controversial whether surgery leads to better results or lower recurrence rates, but the research does indicate that calf strength and return to sport and re-rupture rates are all very slightly improved by surgery. But either way, the best thing we can do in the early stages is to get the ankle in the, in the right position to pull those tendon ends together. Sorry, just one more part for acute injury. So exertional leg pain or, or um, uh, chronic exertional leg pain is very challenging to diagnose and, and often to treat. There's lots of different uh, causes, potential causes. The most common one we see as sports physicians is, sports physicians is compartment syndrome, uh, chronic compartment syndrome. We also have stress fractures and, and tibial stress syndrome, sometimes vascular problems and nerve entrapments. And we know that um, the key features of compartment syndrome, if you have a patient who has intolerance, particularly of running, are that it's in both legs. So they will tend to describe pain either anterior lateral or deep posterior compartment. And it tends to be symmetric and bilateral in over 80% of cases. And um, the, the reason is that we, we think is that those patients have inelastic fascia and it, it basically strangles the muscle as it's trying to expand and increase blood flow during exercise. Uh, thankfully, hopefully none of us will see acute compartment syndrome from exercising patients. Uh, but generally, if the pain is not subsiding, then obviously a patient would need to be referred to hospital for compartment release. So uh, generally, we'll take a full history, do a neurovascular examination, try and pick up some of these key findings of compartment syndrome, such as the bilateral nature, worsening pain with exertion, improvement with rest fairly quickly. Um, often it will localize to one compartment and we sometimes see these muscle herniae, bulging bits of muscle coming out. So all of that relates to restriction of blood flow to the affected compartment. And uh, when we test, we use a little bleb of local anesthetic, send the patient off for a trot around the block to, to go into their pain for at least five minutes. And then we measure the uh, affected compartments at one minute and five minutes and uh, with a, a, an 18 gauge needle and with a little pressure transducer attached. And the diagnosis is established if the pressure is over 30 millimeters mercury at a minute or 20 at five minutes. Okay, I might pause there um, and just see uh, if there were any, um, stop sharing my screen for a moment. Uh, any questions to come through?
David, we do just have one question so far. Uh, Chi would like to know, how do you determine the angle of ankle plantar flexion to immobilise an Achilles tendon rupture? So uh, thank you very much. Good question. The, the angle has to be um, as much as the patient can tolerate. And um, the, the issue there is that some people will have stiffness of their ankle, inherent stiffness of their ankle. And um, it, so it, ultimately, as long as you're not immobilizing them in the neutral position, in the, in the plantar grade 90 degree position, and there is some, uh, and we can, we can try and get those tendon ends together. Um, I guess you I, there are certain advantages to being able to answer that question if the patient is regularly followed up. In the UK, um, in the NHS, they have the largest, um, the largest burden of research on this. They'll even get patients to put a boot on with lots of heel raises in the boot. Um, and so their toe is pointing or sometimes specialized boots that can make the toe point. So yeah, it's, an, it's interesting, but I, I like to make sure if I do manage a patient non-operatively, um, after they're immobilized, I check that the tendon ends are coming together on ultrasound. So I'll just, I'd like to get a little visual there, but that's a little, that's a cheat. But otherwise, as much plant deflection as they can comfortably tolerate. I've got a, a young woman who was in the army. She's actually an air traffic controller, but she must have had to do her basic training. And she has a chronic compartment syndrome, and that's one of her DVA things mm. um but the actually she may have seen you i i i sent her off so, or she's for uh, a surgeon yeah um but it was you know i hadn't really heard of that and was sort of thinking oh does she have to have fasciotomies all the time and um mm. she's certainly a complicated patient yeah, they can be. And sometimes there's overlapping causes. Annalise, it's sometimes really frustrating because you think you've diagnosed the compartment syndrome, but they might also have varico varicosities or venous mm. insufficiency. And um, I think once they've had it for a really long time, they, they develop a little bit of chronic pain as well. So it's really nice to try and pick it up as early as we can. And the treatment is, is fasciectomy where they cut a big window out of the fascia so that it doesn't heal back together um, again quickly. Um, but um, in the past, they used to just do fasciotomy where they do a little cut and then the people, people's symptoms would come back regrettably. So um, things have changed a little bit in the last decade or so. Yeah, Rebecca has a question here. A, a patient, in a woman in her 80s, mm. she has a complete tear of rotator cuff, rupture of long tendon and bicep and pain. Are there any alternative management strategies for her? I wonder if this woman may be a candidate for something like PRP. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a, um, uh, it's, it's hard. I mean, so the description of the tear, so there's a biceps rupture and there's also a, it sounds like quite a large rotator cuff tear. Unfortunately, once they've retracted quite significantly, we're reliant on the other parts of the tissue there um, called the rotator interval to keep everything intact. And if that patient is, um, uh, I think the main thing there is activity modification because we can certainly try PRP, but um, unfortunately it just doesn't put tendon ends together. Um, and once there's retraction, um, it, basically PRP being sort of a, a liquid, it just floats around the joint. It doesn't really uh, have a, a good role. So in, in that patient, um, if she is not, doesn't have a high activity demand, then Surgery may have a higher risk to her than a benefit. Um, but again, it's a very common problem to have the older patient who you, we're really trying to offer them everything we can. But unfortunately, um, as we know, people seem to cope very well with, um, with uh, um, some pretty significant um, issues and rotator cuff tears if we let them uh, leave them to their own devices. And sometimes just changing activities can make a world of difference. One of the great opportunities I've got as a sport and exercise physician is that I do see a huge spectrum of patients in my clinic from essentially from metabolic perfection in really highly insulin sensitive and, and metabolically efficient athletes to the complete end, other end of the spectrum in, in quite metabolically sick patients. And so
You know, when we think of musculoskeletal pain, we tend to focus on the tissue injury, but I think it's important to realize that many of the chronic and recalcitrant problems that we see in musculoskeletal medicine from frozen shoulder to plantar fasciitis are really strongly affected by metabolic health. And that, and that goes well beyond just simple weight and, um, and stress on the joint. So um, we know with tendon pain, as an example, Achilles pain is increased by 350% in uh, patients with diabetes. And, and that really links over and flows over to all other tendon problems from tennis elbow, jumper's knee, trigger finger, they all fall into that category. OA, in particular, hip, hip and knee osteoarthritis are increased by 150% on an already very high rate of OA. And uh, again, it's not just body weight. We know that patients um, with, uh, with that, well, we see that high insulin levels are independently associated with osteoarthritis. And that patients with hand OA get as much as a 50% improvement in their pain and function on average when they lose five to 10% of their body weight. So frozen shoulder is another one. Capsulitis has a 500% increased risk with diabetes and plantar fasciitis. 165%. So all of these things are opportunities when people come in to try to make inroads to, the, to general health and lifestyle habits. And it makes sense that somewhere along the spectrum of disease of what we call the metabolic syndrome or hyperinsulinemia, which 30% of Australians have, that these conditions are, are certainly increased. So there's three main reasons. And, and just really quickly to summarize, we know that high insulin levels lead to visceral fat and visceral fat produces more pro-inflammatory cytokines called adipokines. We know that glucose binds to our tissues as we age and, and that glucose is, um, does cause irreversible, binding, uh, ir irreversible um, glycation. And so it happens in tendons and joints and even the lens in the eye and what we see is cataract. These are, this is rib cartilage played out through the years. And the same thing happens in the hyaline cartilage of our joints. And finally, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease can, can make the liver erratically produce the enzymes that break down tendon and cartilage. And they're only produced in the liver matrix metalloproteinases. So again, it's a great opportunity for us to help patients lose weight. That's another big role for the sports physician. Now, the process of OA can be set off with chondral injuries much earlier in life. And unfortunately, I see chondral injuries too frequently with uh, young, uh, young and middle-aged patients with jarring mechanisms and basically anything that compromises the stability of their joint. And once they occur, they never heal normally. They, they don't heal as articular cartilage, they heal as hyaline cartilage. And we know that it's just too complex to repair this complex architecture. So even stem cells are really just um, a bit of fluff at the moment. There's really no strong research around them. And anyone who's doing stem cells is probably, um, probably a bit of hard cell going on there for at least for osteoarthritis. Now, the cartilage doesn't have nerve endings, as I mentioned. So what we know is that even though radiographically we see joint space narrowing on x-rays here, when we do an MRI, we get to see the actual extent of cartilage loss. But we also see these things, this, all this extra white in the femur, that's a bone marrow lesion. And they're the most, I guess, the strongest association with pain or clinical correlation. Joint space narrowing on an x-ray Commonly, I mean, I'm sure many of you have seen patients and you just can't believe how, how they function and cope with such an arthritic joint. But it's really when they've got this, they've got um, the, the, the nerve endings in the bone are really strongly irritated. And um, they're basically like, it's like a stress fracture in the bone. And so those bone marrow lesions are really a major component in modern research around osteoarthritis treatments now. And we know that microscopic cartilage fragments can break off and increase swelling and degradation. And eventually patients get these osteophytes. And so OA does tend to progress over the years, but it does have an inflammatory and not just a degenerative process. It's got an inflammatory component as well. So we can't reverse it, but we can certainly improve the inflammatory component and help patients learn to manage it. The sad thing is that patients can really have a downward spiral of their health outcomes because the OA often leads them to be inactive, 
um, and then you know poor dietary habits, weight gain, high insulin levels, worsened inflammation, poor sleep, and obviously then their mood and their pain continues to spiral downward, and the cycle goes on. So it's it's really I think it is a priority to try to improve uh, pain and function in patients with OA and um, to avert the other health issues. Now, the principles of OA management are well outlined in this uh, clinical care standard. And um, I contributed back to these back in 2017, along with uh, a host of colleagues from different backgrounds, including radiologists, orthopedic surgeons, nurses, physios. And this is um, based on the, on the principle that the most evidence-based, highest yield non-operative treatments should be used first. And then everything else is uh, less essential. So when we look at it, I, I think it's like baking a cake. The essential treatments are strength exercise and weight optimization, activity modification, just to get the right amount of joint load the patient will tolerate. We know that uh, topical gels can have a big benefit for, for knee pain in particular, knee osteoarthritis, and biomechanical assessment is also often very helpful. Um, even you know, some patients respond significantly to orthotics or changes in the way that they walk. And judicious NSAID use is also quite helpful and sometimes paracetamol. Now, optional treatments that aren't costly, but also not strongly supported by the evidence include physical agents like TENS and acupuncture and nutraceuticals like glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate. And again, these can be trialled with minimal risk. And each of these tools is used within the context of each patient's specific OA phenotype or their features. And obviously joint replacement surgery and the injectable adjuncts are, are only once they've looked at other things. So at the top of the cake, corticosteroid injections, PRP injections, hyaluronic acid and pentacent injections, these can be trialed if those other essential treatments are being addressed. And these tools really should be reserved for patients that are doing the other aspects because the quality of evidence and their effect size is much lower on average when compared to exercise and diet. So in a nutshell, on the, right, on the left here, Duralane aims to replenish the molecule hyaluronic acid that allows joint fluid to change and maintain its viscosity. PRP here in the middle, it's, uh, it aims to modulate the inflammatory environment inside the joint via a paracrine signaling effect. So the platelets signal the synovium. Um, and uh, finally, cortisone is a synthetic version of cortisol, uh, a glucocorticoid. It's a potent inhibitor of inflammation, as we know. So while these injections do have evidence of effectiveness for pain and particularly acute osteoarthritic pain, most of the studies are of, of um, quite high risk of bias. And so the other thing is it becomes very difficult to help patients who have generalized osteoarthritis affecting many joints. That can be really challenging to treat the so-called generalized nodal OA. And this is where systemic treatments are uh, being investigated. Treatments like pentasan polysulfate sodium, and they've got a lot of interest in the mainstream media. Now, what is pentasan? Pentasan's a semi-synthetic polysaccharide. So it's a bit like heparin. It's chemically related to heparin, and it's not as strong as an anticoagulant but it has been used in Europe for that purpose in the past. And scientists have been really brim brimming with enthusiasm for this agent for the better part of two decades as a potential disease modifying agent in OA. And to date, despite the you know, monoclonal antibodies and all sorts of, uh, of drugs that have been tested, there is still not one single drug that can be uh, claimed to be a, a disease modifier. And so uh, pentasan is, is also not a disease modifier or hasn't been proven to be yet. So we go back to this study um, um, in Australia done 20 years ago, and it shows a, a really large number of potential uh, pathways and sites of action of pentasan. Um, in summary, it's thought to act on the cells of the cartilage, the bone and the synovium. Uh, to modulate the production of inflammatory cytokines, the degradative enzymes, those matrix metalloproteinases, and the subchondral blood flow. And I think the blood flow is the most important aspect here. We, we know now that blood flow to the subchondral bone is really crucial to the onset and progression of OA. 
And uh, improvement in these bone marrow lesions seems to correlate very well with pain improvement in the studies. Now, there's only one published randomized trial in humans of Pentasan, and this is back in, I think it was 2005. And the researchers recruited over 100 patients and they did, they, they found quite a big effect size compared to placebo injection. And there was an intramuscular injection in this study for six weeks, twice weekly, up to six months of um, statistically significant improvement, but really only one out of 10 on a VAS scale, which you could argue is not clinically significant. But there were some major drawbacks to the methodology of the study with a really large dropout rate there. So we have unpublished data now in the last three years for Pentasan again um, from a company. And the, they published their 2A trials, which suggest quite a, a significant benefit and minimal harm. And you can see the data that they've released uh, demonstrate that patients with moderate severity knee LA had a really significant difference between um, placebo on the, in the red and the blue here, Pentasan, in terms of the percentage of patients who had at least a 50% improvement in their knee pain. So that's what we would tend to, to call a, a clinically significant improvement rather than one out of 10. And when you look at that, it's um, quite significant in the placebo group, almost 20%, but more than double in the, in the Pentasan group. Now we go through and we look across pain scores, functional scores, this composite score that we just mentioned of about 50% pain relief. And in terms of the size of bone marrow lesions, Pentasan showed clear superiority. But before we get too excited about this, there's a lot of unanswered questions that relate to the quality parameters of this unpublished study. So um, we really look with interest to the peer review process and to see what their, their dropout rate was and to make sure groups were comparable at baseline. But it is promising for Pentasan, especially for patients with generalized LA. Now, another condition we commonly see as sports physicians is the group of, uh, uh, of tendon issues, tendinopathy. And there's multiple examples all over the body from tennis elbow to Achilles tendinopathy. So it's just a very broad term. And, um, but there are some really common patterns of treatment and pathology. And we know that tendinopathy in most patients results in stiffness, pain and weakness when they load their tendon. And um, you know, a tendon is a really, again, a, a very subspecialized unit of tissue. In order to effectively transfer muscle forces to bone, they're packed full of dense collagen fibers in rows and in spirals, a lot like this steel cable here. And that allows them to store and release energy like bungee cords. And so um, unfortunately, there's a bit of a balance that has to occur between the breakdown of the tendon and the remodeling to keep up with that damage as we load them. And there is a high degree of nuance as well. There are certainly tendon conditions that don't fit into uh, the usual management like calcific tendonitis and stenosing tenosynovitis and anthocytis, and they're managed very differently. But under normal conditions, most tendons will have this densely packed collagen fibers that we can see here on the left. And, um, and then when patients have long-term mechanical overload, uh, their tendon can progress through a couple of phases from an inflamed reactive tendon, then to a tendon that has a bit of disrepair that's trying to regenerate. And finally, people can get to this stage where there's established wear and tear of the tendon and uh, rapid recovery and remodeling is very unlikely to occur. So the most important treatment for any stage of tendinopathy is loading the tendon and finding the right load to stimulate the growth of and recovery of that tendon. So when patients have persistence of symptoms for months despite rehab, and we see these little neo-vessels on color Doppler, these signal a degenerate tendon. And so it's reasonable for these patients to seek adjunctive treatments. We know these tendons represent ingrowth occurring to the tendon, that um, these vessels should, uh, represent ingrowth, and they actually occur with nerves as well, or nociceptive nerve endings. And, and we know they contribute to pain and sensitivity. So mechanotherapy is just targeted rehabilitation that stimulates that collagen synthesis in the tendon. 
and it occurs every time we load the tendon. So the worst thing we can do for tendon problems and tendon pain is complete rest for a prolonged period. And uh, what we also know about tendons is um, from, from research in recent times is that even though we changed from tendonitis to tendinosis, um, because there are no inflammatory cells in these worn tendons, there are inflammatory chemicals and cytokines which do respond to non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, for example, or anti-inflammatory treatments. So anti-inflammatory treatments aren't off the table entirely just because it's not tendonitis. And it also, it's, it's really more than just the worn regions of the tendon we focus on. We shouldn't just be obsessed with healing the hole in the middle of the tendon. We, we should accept that those regions aren't going to heal in months and they're going to take a really long time and instead focus on improving the strength and the integrity of the rest of the tendon. And one analogy is this, this hole in the donut analogy where we want to make the rest of the donut bigger. And finally, getting the right dose of exercise for the tendon to remodel and recover at the same time as having predictable and manageable pain is really the main challenge for, re for rehab. So I generally start patients off with simple exercises, so isometrics, and they tend to help with pain. So they have less pain after doing those exercises and um, at the same time, improving the strength of their tendon. And so here's a synthesis of the latest science and, and, and my kind of synthesis on how we should be managing tendons. And we, overall, we wanna get the right stimulus for the tendon capacity to improve. And if we get it too low or too high, we have fluctuant pain. When we get the right load on the tendon, we get predictable and manageable pain, low levels of pain during and after the exercise. And then we need to make sure we treat each individual for their sport and make sure that what their, their whole body movement is optimized, that they have enough substrate for recovery. So the diet and the building blocks of amino acids are appropriate and that we optimize um, their kinetic chain. So any other aspects of their movement are, are addressed. And while over 90% of patients will improve, particularly with Achilles tendon problems, if a patient can't make progress, then that's the time to refer on for specialist advice. Now, one problem that will often be recalcitrant to this approach is calcific tendinopathy. And this causes really severe pain, particularly at night time for, for patients when it affects the shoulder and the, around the ankle, it, it also causes quite a lot of pain around the Achilles. So uh, it does respond quite well to local neurotoxic treatments such as um, uh, shockwave therapy. And this is basically just um, helping break up the ingrowth of some painful nerve endings with acoustic energy. Another condition that's similar to that, 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 that is, a, I guess, a little bit different is stenosing tenosynovitis. And when we look at trigger finger and decur veins, they fit into this bucket. And these conditions actually respond quite well to cortisone injections because the cortisone is not delivered into the tendon, it's delivered into the sheath that strangles the tendon in these cases, which then actually can, can significantly help with the pain. Now in recalcitrant cases where there's lots of hypersensitivity and patients have engaged in rehab, injection adjuncts can be very helpful. This is an Achilles here. And in my opinion, injections for the tendons should be done under ultrasound guidance to make sure that the injection is happening in the right location, but importantly, not traumatizing the tendon. And um, you know, we, it's thought when we look at all of the evidence that all types of injections have some beneficial effect by hydrodissecting or stripping some of these pathological nerve endings that infiltrate a degenerative tendon. But most clinicians would avoid putting cortisone around a tendon in general because of the atrophic effects of cortisone. And this is PRP being injected here, platelet-rich plasma and um, uh, around an Achilles. So you can see it, it being delivered to the ventral or front surface of the tendon where the vessels are entering. And um, it can be performed for our other tendons for a similar purpose. But I think that these injections should be image guided, ultrasound guided, and certainly need to be combined with a rehab plan afterwards. Now, lateral elbow tendinopathy is, can be very difficult to manage. And the elbow indeed is, is a really complex region and often not given enough credit for that. It's not only a hinge joint, but it also 
um, allows us to grip and, and rotate and grapple and move the hand into different positions through this joint, the radiocapitella joint. So it's not just tennis elbow that causes lateral elbow pain. When we look at uh, any condition that is really recalcitrant like this, often there's something else causing it as well. And, and certainly there can be overlapping causes. So another common cause of lateral elbow pain is irritation of this nerve, the posterior interosseous nerve, as it runs under the supinator muscle right underneath the extensor origin. And this can cause pain that radiates down the back of the forearm. Um, pain can also come from the biceps tendon as it inserts under the radius. And it can even come from, um, it can come from the joint itself, the, from cartilage wear in the joint. So all of these structures have one thing in common and that's that they contribute to that rotation um, uh, motion of the forearm and elbow. So um, essentially uh, working up a patient with tennis elbow is often a little bit more complex than just looking for the tendon um, wear. But when we do have uh, lateral elbow tendinopathy or tennis elbow, we focus on the same principles that I, I went through there. Activity modifications, we change how they lift things, the lever arm, how long, how long their uh, arm, how far they hold their arm out from their body. We strengthen not only the extensive function, but also the rotation function of the forearm. I, I like using this flex bar for patients. And we often use some tools like a, a, um, a counterforce brace to reduce pain and improve function. But uh, ultimately, if patients aren't responding to these treatments and, and strength training in particular, then PRP injections at the point of these abnormal nerve and vessel uh, infiltration, just as with the Achilles that I showed you, can really improve pain. And it certainly is in preference to cortisone. Um, studies have shown that uh, cortisone injections lead to more prolonged symptoms when compared to physio or no treatment at over 12 months. So plantar fasciosis is another really common issue that often is caused by many different pain drivers, not just plant, the plantar fascia, the plantar heel has a lot of structures under it. And these structures include the heel bone itself, the calcaneus, um, the branches of the, the uh, plantar nerve, the inferior branch of the lateral plantar nerve can, can get aggravated and irritated. And, um, we know this part of the body takes a huge amount of compressive and tensile force. So um, although this is a very common presentation to sports physicians, surgery is virtually never a good option because it's so close to the neurovascular bundle. And uh, we know that people can improve um, with, without surgery. And certainly in a lot of my patients, it's a sign that they do need to lose weight. Often it comes on quite insidiously and the worst symptoms are in the morning with the first step of the day. And this is your usual profile, middle-aged patient with um, a lot of uh, uh, momentum to get back to fitness and exercise and suddenly upgrading their exercise intensity results in, um, in pain. Now, while we clearly have mechanical sources, again, as I mentioned, the glycation effect and uh, metabolic health is certainly a factor. Um, and we know that in type one diabetics, um, the thickness of the plantar fascia correlates linearly with HbA1c. So um, to me, that's a definite sign that plantar fasciosis is strongly affected by metabolic health. Now the diagnosis is usually straightforward, but here is a couple of tests that take about uh, 10 seconds to do. This is Tennell's test where you tap on the neurovascular bundle to, ch to check for tarsal tunnel syndrome and see if they get a little bit of sharp shooting pain. And this is a heel squeeze test to look for a, a calcaneal stress fracture. And um, generally patients with plantar fasciopathy will have pain directly here, but it's nice to exclude the other things. Now, plantar fasciitis is, it, the plantar fascia behaves a lot like a tendon even though it is an attendant, histologically, it has a very high proportion of type one collagen and it helps us store and release energy just like a tendon. So in addition to the metabolic optimization, progressive strengthening has to be the way to go to, to affect change. And that's exactly what uh, Michael Rathleth and his researchers did. They used a progressive strength program 
modeling the function of the plantar fascia by sticking a little towel under the toe to strengthen the plantar fascia specifically. And they found that to be significantly better than stretches and massage at three months. Now, because patients with this have often tried many things, I often will get them to fill out a checklist to know what they've done. And these treatments generally are, are for pain and they're more likely to, uh, to help with the pain in the short term. But we've got to look at the tissue quality long term. And down the bottom here, the adjuncts for pain um, are the more invasive things like shockwave therapy, cortisone injections, and PRP. But ultimately, it's a bit like uh, a bit like OA. Patients have to bake the cake before we start doing invasive treatments. Now, in recalcitrant cases, sometimes advanced imaging can really help, and it can reveal enthesopathy at the insertion of the plantar fascia, or even stress fractures and bone edema. And this would justify a longer period of rest and sometimes the use of a walking boot for a four week period or so. So if there's systemic inflammatory symptoms and we see enthesitis and uh, that, that could prompt a rheumatology referral. Now for runners, sports physios are very skillful at assessing their biomechanics and working out if there's any breaks in the so-called kinetic chain, such as poor ankle, hip or even great toe range of motion that renders this mechanism overloaded. And ultrasound guided injections, they can include cortisone when there's more of an inflammatory phenotype to the fasciosis. And when there's a partial thickness tear, PRP, platelet-rich plasma is my preferred injectable agent. And this can be deposited in the deep surface of the tendon, but obviously that needs to be uh, individualized. Adhesive capsulitis is a very unique and painful condition. We've all seen it. It involves immunological changes that in, occur inside the shoulder and lead to the deposition of irregular collagen in that capsule. And that, um, that then leads to pain and stiffness that rapidly worsens over a few months, then stabilizes over a few more months and gradually resolves over several months. It tends to cause dull aching pain with sharper shoots of pain that occur with sudden movements, shooting down the front and side of the arm. And other than pain, the most obvious sign is the loss of rotation and elevation of the arm. And patients have an inability to reach behind their back, often at quite an early stage. So after an initial workup, it can be really reassuring for a patient to hear that the natural history is for recovery. And this is how I explain the time of course. So typically it occurs in three phases, each lasting six to nine months, rarely up to three years. The freezing phase or red phase here, the patient develops rapid onset of pain and the pain generally worsens, affects sleep, and they then lose their range of motion you see going down here. In the frozen phase, they experience a really slow, gradual improvement in pain, but the stiffness uh, reaches a peak. And in the thawing phase, the patient slowly regains their range of motion as the shoulder returns to normal. So we're not entirely sure why this occurs, but we know it's associated with immobilization and trauma and surgery, and sometimes with the thyrogastric autoimmune cluster, and certainly with diabetes, as you can see here, it's much more common as much as three to five times relative risk. The x-rays can rule out osteoarthritis, which is the main differential for a painful stiff shoulder. Ultrasound is very easy to obtain. And we see this pattern of increased blood flow at an area called the rotator interval at the top of the biceps tendon on the shoulder. And that's a very specific sign for a frozen shoulder that many radiologists won't pick up on. And uh, MRI generally is only useful if there's significant weakness and you think there's something else going on. So frozen shoulder generally improves without any intervention and it can take one or two years, but uh, generally steroid injections can be effective if uh, patients have a lot of pain and particularly night pain uh, in the early stages. The injection um, doesn't really work if it goes into the bursa, it has to go into the joint. And hydrodilatation injections, which are high volume injections, we're talking about 30 mils plus They've got no strong evidence. They're designed to stretch the capsule of the joint up, but there's no evidence that they're superior to cortisone injections. And they're actually quite painful uh, for the patient. So 
Um, these are only ever considered in the later frozen phases. Now, finally, we're on the home stretch now, concussion. So concussion is a fast moving topic. We've just had the latest consensus conference in Paris. Uh, and um, so this is going to, when it's published, obviously update a lot of the latest evidence on diagnosis and management of concussion. And the latest innovations that we're seeing around concussion are biomarkers such as salivary testing for concussion on field and also visual tracking technology to, uh, for both diagnosis and assessment of uh, recovery. But these are all still in the experimental phase. And um, there's lots of other things out there like monoclonal antibodies to tau proteins, which are uh, right out there and uh, unlikely to um, progress based on their current research. But I, I don't think the assessment process will have changed much based on this consensus. And there may be a little bit more emphasis around baseline screening. Baseline screening in children, athletes, and adults can be really helpful to guide diagnosis and recovery. If you take nothing else from this component of my talk, this is what I would like you to recall. And it, it's essentially something that every clinician who sees patients with concussion should be armed with. It helps us communicate and keep our assessment standardized. Acute concussions tend to go to the hospital, but patients may see uh, you as a GP um, or myself as a sports physician um, in the days after their concussion once they've been sent home from hospital. And um, this is the form that should be filled out when, when you see them to assess them. It's very self-explanatory. There are a few little nuances that I could go through on another, uh, at another time. But if you can go to the BJSM website, so British Journal of Sports Medicine, there's a free download of this standardized concussion assessment tool, SCAT-5. We're likely to move to the SCAT-7 in the months ahead, but this is the current standard of practice. Now, um, the reason we use this is that the assessment is not just a, a neurological assessment, it's also a neurocognitive assessment, and it covers a broad range of different domains of neurological functioning. As you would know, some people can have a concussion and have no headache, but they don't, their mood is affected or their concentration is affected. Others may have no impact on those domains of their neurological function, but they feel dizzy and nauseated. And so this helps us establish the phenotype of each individual's concussion symptoms. It's really important to address the elephant in the room when parents and, and patients come in with uh, concerns around their brain with concussion. It's obviously everyone's most vital and valuable asset. And it's important to reassure patients who've had a concussion that it is a transient reversible disturbance of their brain function. And there isn't uh, unless there is cumulative and recurrent concussions, we don't have strong evidence to say there's permanent damage. So I tend to use diagrams like this to explain the pathophysiology of acute and chronic concussion symptoms. And when you can explain this, patients can understand the rationale for why uh, they need to rest and, um, the prop and engage in the proper management of concussion before going back to work, school, and back to play. And... Um, so, as I've said, the, the, the key here is that we know in, in all of the research that's been published in recent times, that it's not rest, rest and more rest for concussion. A short period of relative rest, which means that the patient is relaxed and calm, not necessarily locked up in a dark room. And that rest then being combined with carefully titrated exercise is much more effective in treating acute and persistent concussion symptoms than rest alone. And it's the role of the physician to exclude the bad things, the focal neurology or causes for symptoms that are ongoing that might be outside of concussion. And uh, ultimately the patient will make a stepwise graduated recovery and doesn't return to sport, especially collision sport until they're fully recovered. Now you can see here there are a number of steps uh, outlined in, in this particular guideline. With each step, the patient has to be symptom-free. And um, 
in the guide in the previous consensus guidelines that has outlined a minimum of five stages here you can see 10 stages this is a slightly more comprehensive approach this is the ccmi approach and and i think this is an excellent approach particularly for children returning and the reason we take this five to ten day approach from the time patients are asymptomatic is that symptoms don't always reflect neurological functioning or at least the resolution of symptoms doesn't reflect resolution improvement in neurological functioning these are a group of aussie rules athletes from melbourne that were tested and at the seven day mark here you can see that their symptoms have got come down on uh, on average that they're very low grade symptoms by day seven but their scores on computerized cognitive testing in 20% were not normalized yet. So despite the majority of them being completely uh, asymptomatic. So uh, that's the main reason that we should be doing baseline testing to pick up the patients who say they're fine and want to return to contact sport. Because we know that return to contact sport before full recovery is associated with increased concussion risk and all other risks. And a, a second concussion prior to full recovery uh, does lead to a more prolonged uh, period of symptoms and recovery. So just very briefly, this is the CCMI platform. It's an excellent platform and I recommend it to clubs and children and parents. It has the advantage of being a remote digital monitoring tool so they can put their symptoms in. The doctor or uh, physician can uh, help upgrade the stage that they're at in terms of return to, to work, work, school and sport. And um, it can also have their baseline testing results all integrated on their device. So this kind of online platform, I think, is the way of the future. And just finally, uh, it is important that we collect data just like with concussion that, that help us understand patient outcomes. And this is certainly um, uh, what we do in sports medicine. Um, patient data, electronic data capture is certainly the way of the future and helps us understand and audit our practice to work out what is working and what isn't, particularly when we're using more experimental and cutting edge treatments. Like we have talked to, tonight about PRP and stem cells and pentasan, and ultimately it does require a close follow-up. Okay. So this is a uh, two page table that summarizes everything we've been to tonight. And um, I will now answer any questions you might have. Thanks, David. That was really wonderful. Um, my brain certainly put with lots of new ideas and uh, revisiting a bit of anatomy for me. Um, I, I, we did. We've got two questions in the chat box, and then if anyone has any last-minute burning questions, please post them now. Um, the first one is a little bit contentious. Uh, a mini article on platelet injections discounted any benefit for the for any condition despite the popularity. I assume you strongly disagree. Uh, no, I think the uh, I'd have to have a look at that article. And um, what I would agree with is that the quality of the evidence is all at very high risk of bias. And as we all know. Any study that has, uh, any time you improve the quality and you reduce the risk of bias in trials, the effect size of the intervention drops. And, um, and I think there's a lot of conflicts of interest around PRP injections, but I think it does take on a, um, uh, I, you know, I think what you have to do is take a balanced approach. Um, every tool we have in our armory has a place. And um, if I think if you're indiscriminately using an agent that doesn't have any significant evidence, uh, then, you know, you're not really helping anyone. So uh, I guess the, the I'd have to have a look at that article because um, th the first thing to say is that it's, uh, if the summary of evidence was based on a minimum standard of quality, then that, that actually would fly. Um, but the problem is that the burden of evidence is all of very low quality. Mm, that's right. Our critical appraisal skills of the literature are very important and worth revisiting. 
So the last question for tonight, can shoulder bursitis, corticosteroid injections, potentially cause more harm than good? Uh, well, again, that's really, um, so there was, there has been one study that showed that a, that a corticosteroid injection in patients who had rehabilitation versus patients with rehab and cortisone, that patients had more persistent symptoms after that had the cortisone. That's one small case series that was published about 15 years ago from memory. I haven't seen that, that data repeated or reproduced. Um, my clinical experience is that you, you wouldn't, you, the, the, the threshold for a cortisone injection is, is where it, it lies. So um, it's like everything, there's risk and benefit. And with, um, if you look at something like rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory arthritis, there's an argument uh, that, that if you inject cortisone into a joint and you do that repetitively, you will increase chondral wear. We know that's the case. And so the atrophic effects of cortisone, uh, uh, especially repeated cortisone injections, uh, are a problem. But by the same token, unchecked inflammation and synovitis uh, increases, rapidly degrades joints. So you, for people with inflammatory arthritis, we know cortisone injections have the opposite effect and preserve their joints. So it really is horses for courses. It depends on the patient in front of you. And it comes down to a threshold. If every person willy nilly has cortisone put into their joint, um, I don't think we're doing people on, on the whole uh, a favor, but if the role for that cortisone, if the, if the specific purpose is to help them uh, engage in rehabilitation with less muscle inhibition, and with, uh, and with some consistency, then it's achieved its purpose. I'm um, Anna, I'm from Health Pathways Southeast Sydney. Um, just letting you know that there is also Sydney Health Pathways, which you're very welcome to use. Um, and we're here to support care 24 seven. Um, so here we've got the QR codes, please. It's a free online tool. You're welcome to jump on and use it anytime. Um, and we really do try and um, encourage people to be using it all the time because you never know when things have changed. We've got up-to-date information. We're constantly updating it to make sure it's there to support you. Um, you've got our login details here. You can use the two login details between the sites. It doesn't matter which one you use, it'll get you there. Um, please feel free to share it with all your colleagues, just not with patients. So bit of a wrap up for Southeast Sydney for the year. We've already developed over 100 pathways this year. Some of the areas that we've done them in is COVID-19, which I'm sure you're all very aware of, and there are some new ones coming out. Um, mental health, melanoma, haematology, gastroenterology, chronic pain, assault and abuse. Um, and we will be um, having probably another 10 or so more um, over December. Um, and these are all the different clinical areas that are now covered by Southeast Sydney. So we've covered quite a lot of areas and we are very ambitious with what we want to achieve next year as well. Um, we also want to take this time to remind you that you can actually nominate yourself for GP colleague referrals. So these are for areas where you might want to refer to another GP as opposed to trying to refer into the hospital system. So um, jump on, have a look at that pathway. Um, so we've got all these different categories that um, you might want to actually nominate yourself for. So if you look after patients in residential aged care and you would happily take a GP referral from one of your colleagues, um, you can put your name there. So please contact our project officer, Sue Baker, and you've got the link there for her. Um, and you can also do it through the website. So every page on Health Pathways has this little blue icon and you can send us feedback or ask us questions and we'll reply to you. So contact details for our team here. I'll send these slides to Lydia so she can send them out to you if any of you are interested. Um, and that's it from me. Thank you.